Hello, everybody. Welcome to season two of the Head in the Game podcast. Um, our podcast is designed to, to speak to people within the world of football um, about their careers and about experiences they have had around dealing with mental health. We're delighted to kick off season two with Mark O'Brien. Um, Mark has a very well-known story, um, has played with, with some top clubs like Derby County, Luton Town and, and Newport County. Unfortunately, at the age of 27, Mark's career had to uh, had to finish due to to a heart condition, um, and look, there's enough kind of talking for me, Mark. We we let you kind of take over and tell your story. How are you doing, Paul? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, things are going all right at the moment. Like it took a lot of adjusting, I think, over the last two years now after retiring to kind of get me head screwed back on right. Like I had a lot of down times and a lot of times to kind of think things through and to kind of get me head around a lot of things, but. Like I said, it was something that um, I knew I had to do because I knew once the decision was made, there was no going back. And I think um, I see the bigger picture on a lot of things now. There's something that it took me a while to see, but I'm I'm kind of glad I kind of persevered with it um, along the way. Good. So, look, Mark, we'll probably get into a lot of that stuff a little bit later on in the chat, but let's kind of start for people that maybe don't don't know your whole story, Mark. Um, We'll go from the beginning. You're from Ballyfermot. Um, you play with Cherry Orchard. Do you want to kind of talk about playing as an underage player and how that went and, and getting spotted to go to the UK? Yeah, like um, I played back in like in Dublin with Cherry Orchard and I was with them for about nine, ten years. So I think when I was at Cherry Orchard, it was something where my brother was two years older than me playing with Cherry Orchard. And it was just something where when I was watching him playing, I just decided I wanted to go up and play football. And um, my dad brought me up and um, I played with it, with an age group that was older than me. And my dad was just like, right, just take it as training. Don't um, don't tell them that you're going to sign. I don't say, don't don't agree to anything. But then they said I'd done really well and they wanted me to sign. So my dad told me to wait a year and he was going to bring me back again. And I went back to Cherry Orchard a year later and ended up signing there. And like I said, I had the same manager that was with me from the age of eight all the way till I moved away at 15. And as I said, it was some of the best times there. And I just really enjoyed playing back in Dublin. Like, it was something where it was never really, like, a eye-opening thing for me at the beginning to say I wanted to be a professional footballer. I just enjoyed playing. And then it was when I started to get, like, really serious around, like, the DDSL, going to the Kennedy Cups and, and the Cashin Cups and getting picked for the Young Ireland ages, that I started to think to myself, this is all that I ever want. This is the only thing that I want to do. And, as I said, it's when people start giving you that kind of recognition to kind of say, do you know what, like you're doing really well, or you're a good player, that you only start believing it in yourself. But again, like I said, like I never, I was never someone to always believe that I was a good player. There's been loads of same players in the in the league that I played in, like the Jeff Hendricks, Robbie Brady's, there was John Egan's the same age as, as me. And as I said, all of them players who I think everybody knows have gone on to do so well in their careers. Um, I was I was part of that group. So, like I said, it was it was something that um, for me myself, I just was enjoying it, and luckily enough, I got given the opportunity to fly away and 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 like leave leave me home at at fifteen. Yeah, and how how was that when you when you made that move over to it was to Derby, right? Yeah, like it it wasn't bad to be honest. Like um, like I know a lot of Irish players you like would struggle with homesickness and stuff like that, and I think for me personally. I was lucky enough that I didn't because football was the passion and the dream. And to know that I was going to get to play football every single day and train every single day, um, I would have moved halfway around the world for it. So the fact that you take a 40-minute flight across the water, um, it made no difference to me. And I loved every minute of it. And Derby was a place that, as I said, I, I like it, 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 is, it was like a home from home for me. And it's a place that I'll always hold close to me even till this day. But at the same time, I think, because I felt so settled there, I know a lot of players who move away go for the stature of the club and go for like the biggest move possible and they think it's amazing. But I went on the basis of it was somewhere where I felt comfortable and happy to to play and and, and it, it kind of paid off for me in the end. Yeah, and so you made your, your first team debut in May 2009 and, and kind of, you know, one, one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation is because you, you've... A very important story, I think, about your issues, obviously, with your your heart condition, and um, 
November 2009, you had open heart surgery, right? And and did you feel at that point, obviously as a young player, you've just finally got your break six months earlier, six, seven months earlier. Did you feel at that point, well, this is it, this is the chance gone? Or did you still see that? Did you still have that vision that, you know, I'm going to continue to play professionally, I'm going to continue to kind of strive for that high level, high level um, career? Yeah, like it was difficult, don't get me wrong, because as you said, I made my debut and I was lucky enough to make it at 16. So you think the world's at your feet. I've I, I, I've I've done so well. I've played in the first team. This is all I want. And like I was on cloud nine coming home to Dublin in that summer. Um, but then once I went back, <coughs> went into pre-season and <coughs> I had the routine heart scan and found out that I needed the open heart surgery. Like at the beginning, it wasn't so vital. They told me I wouldn't need it for 20, 30 years. So I always knew football could be finished by then and I'll move on with life. And if that has to come to it, I'll deal with it when it comes. But then um, it progressively got worse. And then I had follow-up scans and found out that I needed the operation, which what I thought was 20 years, it ended up turning out to be that year. And I'll never forget the conversation of going into the doctor's office with my mom, my dad. And I know I've spoken about it a lot, but from at the age of 16, it's something that always sticks out for me. Like I could remember it like it happened yesterday. And you don't think you remember so many different things, but that's something that just sticks out. And I sat in the room and um, it was, and the doctor came in with a model heart in his hand. And he basically said, um, your heart is three times the size of what it should be. And if you don't have this operation done this year, you're going to die. And that's, the, the, he put it as bluntly as that to me. And I think it was one of them moments where you don't think he's talking to you. You don't think it's something that he's saying it to you. You just think this, how can this happen to me? Like, I'm fit, well and healthy. I don't feel any symptoms. And I think it was something that, obviously, my parents got more of a shock about. To me, the only question that I asked them, obviously, being 16, was, can I still play football? Like, I didn't think or didn't care about the operation, didn't care about anything else. I just asked him, could I play? And he told me I'd be lucky enough to go play down the park with my friends, let alone professionally. So, there and then, I kind of struggled to get my head around to think um, I might play professionally again. I thought it was all going to fall apart on me that I got a taste of something that I always wanted as a dream. And to find out that it was something that might not happen ever again, like it was devastating. But he gave me a glimmer of hope to say there's a procedure they can do to give me the best chance possible to maybe play or maybe to play down the park. Like they gave me the best chance possible. And like I said, whatever everyone was going to give me the best chance possible, I went for and. I always made that pact to myself whenever it was going to happen again. Um, I was always going to retire. So this was the once and only chance I was going to give myself. And um, like I said, they told me it would last a year to a maximum of five years. Um, I, they, they didn't know how long it was going to last me or even if it would like take to my body like when I, like when they put the pigskin valve in. And um, it was difficult to take. Um, I was lucky enough at the time. Um, Derby County offered me a new three and a half year contract. So I feel as though they, they showed their faith in me to give me as much time as possible to get back fit, well and healthy. Um, and I think also for them to show that much faith in me and like the fitness coach who was there, Steve Haynes, he helped me out massively. Like it was all new to them as much me because they've never rehabbed a heart before. I don't think anyone you could turn around and say that they've got experience in rehabbing a heart. They could only go on how I was feeling and the physio who was there, Neil Sullivan, at the time, he was amazing. He he stuck by me through everything. And Nigel Clough, as a man, let alone just a manager, was phoning me up every day to make sure I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, making sure my family were okay, making sure I was okay. And just giving that like kind of level of um, humanity to it rather than just seeing me as a footballer. And that in itself kind of gave me that bit of motivation to, to kind of pursue it and to, to push back again. And like I said, I was lucky enough that I had the operation in the October, November time and I was back playing football by, by the end of April and I made the first team bench by the last day of the season. So, like, it was a whirlwind of a season where at one minute I thought my whole career was finished to then I felt as I was reignited again and I was back playing. So, like I said, it was, um, it was like, a very, like, tough time. But at the same time, it was, it kind of moulded me to how my career kind of panned out for me where I played every year like it was my last. So I suppose, you know, from what you're saying there, it's obviously a, a big stretch of time that you haven't been, you weren't able to play during, during that season. How, and, and you've spoke there a little bit, obviously, about your parents, the support you had from them, people within the club, 
could you just tell the people either listening or watching this like how, how important that is that you know you had that support around you in terms of the mental side of it because I'm sure I'm sure there's times during that almost 12 months probably you know or whatever or nine months where you feel like am I just going to pack it in like how how important is it to have that support to just keep you going on those days that that might be a struggle oh it was it was massively important because like I said, if, if, if you have everyone around you panicking and, and kind of putting doubt in your own mind, everyone was just as positive as me. Like they were, they were taking a step by step like I was taking a step by step. So I think for me personally, I think I needed like me mom and me dad. Um, they helped me out massively. They, they were basically saying, right, Mark, whatever you want to do, like you will get back, you will get back. And like I said, I always... Without saying it out loud, you always have that doubt in your head to think, am I going to be the same player? Am I not going to be the same player? What But what are people going to think? But I think also what stood in my favour, being 16 and so naive to the actual severity of the operation is something that um, stuck, like that that went in my favour because I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't fearful of doing anything. I just wanted to get back playing football. So I think with the support of obviously the physios and, and Derby as a club and everybody involved with Derby at the same time as as my family and stuff like that. Um, like, I, I, I don't think I probably would have made it. And I think Noiser Clough as a manager, if he never stuck by me, um, I don't think I would have had a football career. Because, like you say, some managers treat you as, a, um, as an asset to the club. And if you're not playing, then you're not an asset. Whereas he treated me as a normal human being, that he looked after me, made sure I was okay. And as I said, it was even... Even at the time, we had uh, Irish lads at Derby, like we had a fella, Graham Kelly, Jeff Hendrick was there, and and a, and a fella, uh, Ryan Connolly. And um, they all, like, were, they came up to the hospital to visit me. And like you say, they were moments where it really hurt me at certain times because I felt as though, oh, why, why do I have to be the one in the hospital bed? Why can't I be out playing with these? But also, they stood by me through it all, and they were as positive as everybody else. So like you say, I think the key, the positive, the positivity around it, and to have that support, is what gave me that little bit of an edge to kind of say, okay, well, everyone has showed this much faith in me. It's it's going to be me now to to show all like what it means to me and how much they've helped me, and I want to show it all back again. And like I said, the only way I was able to do that was to get myself back fit for football and and show me thanks that way. Brilliant. I'm gonna let Steph jump in here. Yeah, hiya, Mark. Sorry, sorry for running late. Few oh, kids yeah, to, a few kids to put to bed and everything so <laughs> uh, no all good uh, just listening to you there like it's real inspirational sort of you sort of turn the negative into a sort of positive and you're able to use that then as your as your goal and your motivation then to, to sort of you know sort of feet, reach your sort of achievements and stuff like that um, it's fantastic and it's uh, to see Nigel Clough and someone like that someone of his stature even to support you along the way must have been brilliant for for you as well. Like, yeah, like, and and that's the thing. It's uh, he wasn't just a manager to me at the time, and even till this day, I don't see him as a manager. He was someone who, like you say, he had that human aspect to it, where you were treated as like one of his own to an extent. He he looked after me to make sure I was okay, and it wasn't just to make sure I was okay for football. He wanted to make sure I was okay, as in physically. How were you feeling? When I had to go home to Dublin for a couple of months, he was phoning me, he was phoning me family to make sure they're okay. And like I said, him as a person and and not just as a manager, but like I say, as a person, to show that faith and to kind of keep that level of trust in me to get back fit and to make sure I was okay. Like I want like I would have went out and I wanted to show me respect by if I got back fit. I wanted to play as much as I could and, and 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 put bodies on the line like how I normally used to play, but just that added extra bit to kind of say, you know what, like if somebody has shown that much trust in you, like I want to be able to like give everything back tenfold to that person. And like I did to Derby as a club and even till this day, like I still have good contacts there. And like you say, I think it's just a matter of when you come across good people in life, it's to hold on to them and not kind of just take it for granted that okay, they helped me through this time, now forget about it. Like, I, I've I've held on to a lot of people in life and it's put me in good stead for, for things that kind of unfolded from the whole thing. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear on it. Sort of, sometimes you can, like, football's a cruel cruel game and it's a cutthroat and sort of when you hear these stories, it just 
gives you a renewed optimism that mm -hmm. there there is good people in the game and it's fantastic that he was able to look out for you. I suppose just moving on on from Derby, like how did how did your time end there? I, I, I you went up to Motherwell and known for a spell as well. Yeah, and um, my time ended there. Like I was I was out injured with like an, the way I'd call it a normal footballing injury. Um, I was out with a knee injury and. As I was getting back fit, Nigel Clough got sacked from Derby at the time. So Steve McCarran came in and, like I said, it was a new manager, new experiences. He was bringing in his own new players. And it was something where I enjoyed the training. I felt as though I learned a lot from him um, technically wise and and tactically about like my positioning and, and, and certain aspects of my game. So I kind of appreciate all of that. But then I wanted to go out and play games. Like I knew with this, like I said, what, happened to me at 16. I didn't want to wait around and, and hopefully wait for my chance. I needed to play and wanted to play because I never knew when my career was going to be finished. And I think for me, personally, um, not a lot of people knew, but I got a scan at the end of every season or in the middle of every season to see if I could continue playing football. And nobody knew that through my whole career. And that was something that was a personal thing to me. So if I got injured or if I wasn't playing, it would affect me that bit more because... I knew that my kind of career was on a time scale and nobody ever else knew that. So when I got the opportunity, um, Stuart McCall got me to go up to Motherwell. And like I said, it was it was eye-opening because at the time I thought Derby was the only club for me. Like you do as a young player to think this is the one and only club that I need and this is the only one club that I want. And I went out and I ended up making more experiences and made up more friends up that end. And as I said, that in itself opened my eyes to a, a broader level of football and I loved every minute of it. And as I said, that was my final year at Derby to spend my year up at Motherwell. And like I said, I don't regret it because it kind of gave me more opportunities elsewhere and gave me that belief that there's more to life in football than just Derby County if it doesn't work out there. And that's why sometimes as, as I look back now, I kind of appreciate the times of um, getting told the harsh truths from Steve McLaren at the time. Um, to say maybe like time at Derby isn't quite right and you need to move on and make experiences and make a career. And I think at the time I didn't appreciate it because I wanted to stay at Derby. But I think looking back now, to have someone so honest with you, to not just hold on to you for the sake of holding on to you, um, I appreciate it. And I've spoke with him since. And like I said, it was something that I've, I've said it to him out straight that that was like the turning point to kind of help me make a career of this rather than just to kind of be one of these people that just stick at a club for the sake of being there. It's it's not easy to, to you know uh, take take the harsh truths like that. But I always found myself you you'd rather someone was honest with you and upfront, and then you can, and then you can go with it rather than someone just stringing you along and and keeping you there. Like um, obviously you went up to Motherwell. How, how was Stuart McCall with? Did he find out about the heart condition obviously before you signed? And how was he about that? Or yeah, look, I think I think like. It wasn't, it wasn't a hidden secret. Like, I think people knew that I had a heart condition, but the only thing that they knew about was, are you fit to play? And I was yeah. always fit to play. So I think once I was fit to play, then I was treated like any other normal footballer. And that was something that I wanted to achieve from 16. I wanted people just to treat me as a normal footballer. I didn't want to be, oh, he's got a heart condition, we can't sign him. Or I wanted to just be judged solely on my football and that was it. And I think... I done well enough to be able to achieve that. And that's something, like I say, when people see it as I retired early from football, I see it as like I gave it the best shot that I could and I I got treated as a normal footballer. And Stuart McCall himself, as a as a manager, texted me when the story came out and he said it himself, saying, Mark, I never knew that you needed a scan year to year. Um, it's extraordinary that you had it on your shoulders for the whole time. You should be very proud of yourself. And even just to get a message like that kind of made me feel a bit better about the whole situation because I thought, well, do you know what? Even if a manager that I played on that basically signed me for my ability on a football pitch rather than not sign me or to kind of have doubt about me was kind of, to me, it was like a success story in itself to say, do you know what? Like I made the most of, of, the worst, of a bad situation, put it that way. Like I'd say I'd made the best situation of the cards I was dealt with and like I say, sometimes it's 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 tough to look back on. But I, the one thing I'm glad about is that I haven't got a single regret of anything that I've done. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear Stuart McCall reaching out to you. It's sort of a heartwarming, and then you can have have the pride in yourself 
after all you've done, like you you were sort of thinking you were on power of time and to make a successful career and prolong it as long as you did it was incredible, incredible in itself and a uh, fair play. And um, just going on, I suppose if you, you finished up at Motherwell, you it was only a short spell up there and you enjoyed your time, but you knew it was only a loan spell. Were you sort of in the shop window then looking around for clubs or did someone come in for you straight away? I was kind of in the shop window to an extent, I think, because Motherwell was something where, yeah, if they wanted to keep me on, I probably would have stayed. But they had a change of manager at the time with Ian Barraclough. And that was something where, like you say, football is one of them game of opinions. When managers change over and you're not their kind of type of player, it's the harsh reality of football sometimes. And sometimes you have to learn the hard way where it is sometimes a massive game of opinions. And if one opinion is different to somebody else's, you've got to just accept it. And and that's just the way it kind of worked out for me. But um, John Still, the Luton manager, came in for me and phoned me when I was in Dublin and asked me to go over on trial. They went away to Portugal for 10 days. And like I said, I, I, I said yes straight away. And once I went there, they, they signed me off the back of the 10-day trip away to um, the 10-day trip away to Portugal. And I loved my time there. And I know a lot of people like look back at my time at Luton and I didn't really play that often. But I think a lot of people thought I was injured, which obviously injuries did follow me at certain aspects and times of my career. So a lot of people thought if I wasn't playing, he must be injured. But it was just, again, it was... Unfortunate that at a certain time, six months into me contract there, there was a change of manager. So the change of manager again, and it was something where he wanted to play. He wanted to play his own style. He wanted to play his own players, and I was not. I was seen as a John Still player. I wasn't seen as a player he brought in. So, like you say, you have to take that harsh reality. And Luton taught me a lot of lessons about just the kind of as a professional to kind of look after yourself and to keep yourself smiling and to keep yourself happy and to keep yourself motivated and going going on strong because I feel as though I've seen it a lot now where the manager doesn't want you to play. He doesn't really want you around the around the squad training and you have to take the heart you have to take the reality of saying, okay, they want you out this door. So I'm gonna to have to like kind of keep myself motivated and keep coming in smiling each day and to keep myself happy. And um I think that taught me a massive lesson and it put me in good stead because I never fell out with the manager. I knew that it was a it was a business choice to kind of say I'm not his kind of player. But again, I ended up taking a loan move out to Southport when I was at Luton and that loan move is what kind of stemmed for me to progress my career where I know a lot of people think it's a step backwards to go down to the conference. But to me, like I say, the love of football is all I wanted to do. So if a team wanted me to go play for them, I would have played anywhere. So I went and played seven games at Southport and done really well there. And then the manager of Southport um, ended up being assistant manager at Newport. And then that's how you end up at Newport because I've done well for one manager. So I look at all these different things and I say, I, I ended up like making a pathway for myself without realising I was making it. And I was, I was lucky enough that these people along the way had trust in me and, I always managed to just be myself around everyone and that is something that put me in good stead because I never burned bridges with anyone. I, I was always friendly and from anybody in the club, from kit men, dinner ladies, to the manager, to the to the chairmen, everybody, I was always just polite and myself to everybody. And like you say, it puts you in good stead when you need that help and hand from people that, that are willing to help you. Yeah, a real, a real testament to your character that Wherever you've went, everyone's had a sort of good, a good, a good reflection of yourself, and um, you know that as we all we sort of talk about it amongst ourselves as a group and heading heading the game. Like if you can be it and be kind, and it'll it'll take you a long way. And it's a like it's up in your upbringing as well. Like it, it's it's incredible how you can change somebody change somebody's day and change somebody's whole opinion just just by being kind to them. No matter, no matter what it was, and to show people from the manager right down to dinner ladies or wherever you said the same the same level of of respect is just is just brilliant. Like it's sort of inspiring to see someone because I know people hold hold like professional football players up on a level. And when you see someone showing the <clears throat> kind of humility, it's 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 incredible to see. So um yeah, no, it's it's really great to be speaking to you and um 
obviously, look, you've you've went on from Southport, and then the, the system manager came in at Newport. Was it was it just a straight away? Yeah, I want to go there because you knew the system manager. Well, I knew like me time like me time at Luton. Um, I knew they wanted me out the door, so that was something where I knew I had to like look for other options, and I knew I worked with them before, so I put a text in through to them saying. Look, Luton, I wanted to let me go. Is there any chance you'd be able to get me to to uh, Newport? So he spoke with the manager at the time, which was Graham Wesley. And um, yeah, I ended up getting a text over the Christmas saying, are you fit? And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, we wanted to come in. So I ended up going up to Newport. Um, it was the January, um, it was six months into the season. And I didn't play, I didn't play for Luton for six months because it was that season that the manager didn't want me in. So... I, I knew I wanted to go out and play and then they said, okay, you're going to come in and we wanted to play straight away. So you, I hope you're fit. And I was like, yeah, no, I am. I've been doing everything I can to keep myself fit and well. Like you kind of, yeah, you, you like that's that's what I mean by I kind of learned the hard way where I had to keep myself fit because you never know when the next opportunity is coming. And luckily enough, Newport brought me in and it was that season that I ended up playing 20 games at the end of that season. Um, I played all the way till that season I played against Luton in that same season we got a draw um, so I kind of that was that was a kind of good moment for myself to kind of prove to the Luton manager I was capable of playing in this league it was kind of like that kind of moment um, and then at the end of that season uh, luckily enough um, we were obviously in that relegation battle and then I ended up scoring that goal that in the 89th minute that saved them from relegation so that in itself was my very first professional goal Again, there was so much more to it because I feel as though the four six months that I had of training with an academy side, the manager not wanting me and feeling like my next step is going home to Dublin and, and kind of trying to keep myself motivated for it to then finish in the way that it finished, to be on top of the world again. Like that's why I, I always cherish football so much because it's such of a roller coaster. Within six months, you feel as though football's over, and then the next six months, football's the greatest game ever. And I feel as though that for an achievement in itself for me, I looked at it and said to myself, I said, Do you know what, I, I, I actually deserve that for myself for how I've been this year and how things have happened. And I kept myself going and this is the good reward you get for kind of keep yourself going and keep yourself motivated and smiling each day because, like you say, it does all come back around at some stage. Yeah, sort of justification of having the correct attitude and just... You know, you never know when opportunity knocks and um, look to score the goal at the end to keep them up. I'd say, I'd say you were living off that one for a while around the, the Newport area. I'm still living off it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Look, you're, you're sort of look, looking up information on you, and the first thing that came up was the was the goal, and it looked like a it looked like a striker's finish. In all fairness. Like, and the, the, the funny thing about it is, I scored the exact same goal in training the day before, and no they way. all said, Oh, no, you're at the waist, and they, you're not going to score again. And then the exact same thing happened in, in the game, so it was it was kind of like a moment that you look at and say that was meant to happen, but it could have fallen to anyone. And I think just the achievement of that whole six months that was in it and the hard work that went into it, like I said, I know I get the credit for it, and people say oh, I'm the one that saved it, but. If it wasn't for like the players that that manager brought in, if it wasn't for, again, Wayne Hatswell, who came in in that six months, and Michael Flynn, who came in in that six months, like you say, they changed the whole atmosphere of the place. They gave us the confidence to keep going week after week. And again, Mickey Demetrio, the fellow who scored the penalty in that great escape the last day of the season, another one who I ended up getting great mates with and also a great partnership in football that, like you say, I've, I've created memories here at Newport that will last me a lifetime. Yeah, it's incredible to have that connection with the club. I know uh, Dino's good mates with, with Hatswell from his time with Dundalk. Dino, tell us a bit about Hats, your mate. Mm -hmm. I can't. This is about mental health. That, and I say I'll be contradicting myself. But, uh, <laughs> I, I know, know what you mean. Hats, Hats is a great fella. Um, but I suppose, you know, even after that, uh, Mark, your time at Newport, like, they kind of hit a golden patch, didn't they? You know, in terms of, of league or not league, but sorry, but cup runs and things like that. There, you know, how um, you were saying that the Flinney and Hats kind of changed the atmosphere. How was it during that time? You know, they obviously at quite a young age they made you captain of the, of the team as well. How how was that to be kind of honoured with that? Given, given as you say, you went through a six month period where you thought 
football is use like football is terrible for me, and then you go into yeah. enjoy it and you go to this club. How how was that to go through that period and to be named captain of the of the club as well? It was brilliant to go through it because, like I said, I think you, like if you're going to be in football, you're going to gain so many different experiences, and it's going to be some of the best times of your life, and it's going to be some of the worst times of your life as well. And that's something that I think you have to prepare yourself for, which I don't think some people are prepared enough for because it is a roller coaster. Like because you're ne- it's never going to just go better, better, better. You're going to have setbacks and. I think I'm glad I went through the downtime at Luton that I did to see the different side of football that some people would, some people are lucky enough never to see. And if you never see that side of football, then great. But I think it's something where it is in football where there are a lot of people that can be, to an extent, I look at it as, say, mistreated. But also you have to accept it because it's your profession and if it's what you want to do, um, you have to keep yourself pushing along because at some stage your luck will turn and that's how football works and I had to learn that for myself and like I said um, when I came to Newport and, and again when when the likes of Michael Flynn and Wayne Hatswell and they made me captain and stuck by me through a lot like I owe a lot to, to, to both of them because as you say it's a change of manager again with Graham Wesley who left and I thought oh here we go again change of manager I've had it at three other clubs I don't need it to happen here but because I kind of played six months previous to that and Michael Flynn was kind of one of the coaches in the background, he kind of knew what I was capable of doing and he kept me going and he seen me as a, he seen me as a, a leader of the group, someone who could talk a lot and, and kind of lead them in, in certain ways. And as I said, um, I felt privileged to kind of get that, to get that recognition because I always felt as though I, I was like, a, I was a good talker on a pitch. I was good at communicating, but to me to be honoured with, an armband, like I say, it, it's something where I was lucky enough at the time to be a captain of the squad that we had because I felt as though we had a squad of leaders and it could have been anybody at the time. And and like I said, it, it wouldn't have stopped me from talking any less. Even if I didn't have the armband, I still would have carried on being the same player. But to kind of get that privilege of being a captain of and be the leader or the, or the standout leader of the group, um, it was great. And like I said, I had the respect of everybody and when you have the respect of your own teammates, that's half the battle because they actually respect the decision and, and the stuff that you say to them. And like I said, um, to go through that, it felt as though football works in mysterious ways that, like I say, for the downtimes that I've had and the injuries I've had and the setbacks that I've had, it all kind of comes together at a certain club. And that's why sometimes I say football is actually about making memories and, and making good times and, and not getting too low with the lows because if you keep yourself motivated to a certain aspect and you keep yourself going and you have the right people around you, football will work in such a great way where you'll end up having the best time of your life. And and that's the way that I've seen it, that when, once at Newport, I felt as though it's the place for me. And it's it, it was, I know at the time they were struggling, but like I said, if I was happy playing somewhere and somewhere where people respected me and I felt happy playing, it was where I got the best football out of myself. And Derby was the same. And like I said, it was it, it's the way I describe Newport. It's like the this it, it's like another home from home. And I never thought I would have got that same feeling from when I left Derby. And I did found that I found that at Newport. And like I said, I, I ended up creating the best memories that I could here. And like I said, I still am involved with the club now. And it's a, it's a club, it's another club that's close to me heart. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, kind of moving on, you, you've had all that success. And it, even though when you joined the club, it was at a low point, there was obviously the historical cup runs that Newport had and stuff. And, you know, getting getting close to playoff places and, and getting to the playoff final and things. But 2020, COVID hit. Um, June, June, I think, of 2020, you, you had to have the surgery to, to on your half valve. Did you kind of feel at any point during that kind of high time with Newport? Did you feel like this is too good to be true? This the time is running out, or anything like that? There, or were you expecting that to come? Did it come out of the blue? It came out of the blue because um, I think I was riding me luck for a little time because I never knew how, when the valve was going to like obviously um, not stop working, but I never knew when it was going to kind of give way. So having that scan every year, I knew it was going to be that one year I'd go back for that scan and that was going to get told the news. So to an extent I was kind of just I was enjoying the times here and, and that's how I done it with my career I enjoyed every year like it was my last so 
when I was at Newport and I had one great year, right, if I went for a heart scan, they said it was fine, right, I was looking forward to my next great year. And then after that, I was going to look forward to my next great year. But for in that one season or whatever that I was going to get at Newport, I wanted to make the best memories that I could. And that's how I, like, that's how my whole kind of career panned out. And as I said, it probably, that's what got the best out of my career because I never, like I said, I never got too low with the lows and I never got too high with the highs. I enjoyed them. But at the same time, I kind of knew, no, I'm going to just keep going and I'm going to keep putting body on the line because, like I said, next year I might have to retire. But again, as much as I always said, I knew it was going to come. I don't think I was ever prepared for it because you're never prepared. I was always kind of on the optimi- like the optimist side to say every time I go to the doctor, I'm just expecting good news because that's all I ever got. So that one time when I went back and I was feeling the palpitations in my chest in the very first lockdown. So I went and got a scan, found out it was leaking again. And as I said, it was, it was something where I never really... I, it, like it, it hit me a lot harder this time because I knew the second time it was going to have to mean retirement then I remember I found Mike Flynn and I had to say it to him down the phone because I went for the heart scan and said to him I was like look I have to retire and he said what? and I said yeah I have to retire and you could hear the disappointment in his voice and you could hear that he was kind of upset for me as a person because like I said I got on with people more on a personal level that just it wasn't just a manager like I was I was friendly with everybody so people like I actually like felt for me because they knew how much I loved football and what I put into it. And like I said, um, it was a lot to take in because obviously the lockdown happened. So no one knew what was happening with football. Um, my career just ended. So I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And then I also had to deal with open heart surgery all at the same time. So I knew myself, my head was all over the place, but I was trying to take everything and I was trying to separate it all at all and try and deal with each one separately. And that was difficult. So I ended up having panic attacks I was having anxiety attacks that I never had before like I was having all these different things that I never experienced and um, again like once I ended up having to retire I felt as though like I I lost myself I lost everything like I felt as though me as a person like I have no purpose anymore like Mark the footballer is gone nobody's going to want to speak to me nobody's going to want to know me I'm, I'm like to an extent you feel as though you've just lost your life because all football is all I've ever known. And I think I had to go through all of that to kind of be where I'm at now in, 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 in the strangest way possible. I had to go through the down times to kind of understand or appreciate the smaller things rather than thinking football is the be all and end all. Like, and it gives me that kind of experience to be able to speak out a lot more to say these things happen to just anybody. Like it's not just, it's not just any, any kind of person in the street that I can happen to like, I felt as though like I did lose so much of myself. I lost confidence. I lost everything. And and to deal with the open heart surgery was one thing. But then once I finished the open heart surgery, then I had the whole new whole like other problem of dealing with retirement. And that in itself was so difficult. So I had to go through counselling. I had to go through a lot of uh, CBT training. I had to speak to two, three counsellors. I had to speak with people who have dealt with retirement. Like, I had to go through so much and along the way I was having anxiety attacks. I was having panic ups. I was having like sleepless nights because I was afraid. Like, look, I, like I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. I was, I was afraid I wasn't going to wake up the next morning because I didn't think to myself, I didn't trust the process of my heart. I was 27. I knew, I knew the extent of the whole operation that I went through. I knew the implications of everything. Like there was so much. And obviously you're going through it during a pandemic where you're thinking if I catch COVID, I'm, like I'm, I'm, I must be one of the vulnerable people. So there was so much that was going on at the time, and as I said, I did struggle a lot. But again, I had, and you know yourself what he's like. I had Wayne Hatswell who would phone me in the hospital. He'd FaceTime me most days. I'd send him a text to let him know how I was getting on. He'd FaceTime me to make sure I was okay. And like again, again, I had Noisa Clough text me to make sure I was okay. And that's something that I didn't speak to him for five years because, like, obviously you, you go your separate ways in football and. You still stay in touch here and there, but he phoned me to see if I was okay and if I ever need anything just to call out and if I'm ever up around the Midlands to drop in and say hello. Like so that again goes to show the person that he is, Wayne Hatswell, Michael Flynn, the club in themselves. Like I, I like the, the names I can just reel off that have helped me is 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 amazing. Like and I think sometimes I had people have to kind of say to me, Mark, but this is because the person you are 
these people want to help. But to me, I always, I was always want to be the helper. I never wanted to be the person where I thought I needed help. Because as you say, I see myself as a captain. You feel yourself, what like everybody's going to come to you with their problems. And that's the person I always felt so was. So it was difficult for me to actually reach out and ask for help. But when I actually did, like some of the lads on the football team with Matty Dolan and Mickey Demetrio, there's David Pipe, there's so many people that when I was having panic attacks at 11 o'clock at night, curled up in bed on my own, shaking and shivering in bed, I'd make one phone call to the lads and they're straight at me door. And this is like a day before training and they come over and look after me straight away to make sure I'm okay. So like you say, sometimes you, you don't find these people in football, but you kind of, you if you, like the way I see it is if, if you're just a genuine person and you get along with people, like there's help there tenfold. And I was lucky to have these people around me and like the physio himself, Tom Gittos, Lewis Bins. The, the club doctor, Daniel Vaughan, like all these people that I could phone in a heartbeat and straight away they would like be there on the phone to make sure I was okay. They'd be there to make sure everything was okay. They'd make sure I was going to get back to fitness. They were helping me through everything and they still to this day still check in on me to make sure I'm okay when I'm in the club and if I need anything, they're willing to help out. And they don't try and help me too much because they know that's not normal life because I'm not part of the football world anymore. But anything they can do, they'll physically put themselves through. Like, they'll they'll drive me anywhere. They'll do anything for me. And to kind of be able to show that respect back and to know that these people respect me enough and to, to kind of help me, is, it's, it, 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 it blew me mind. And it, and it kind of, it opens your eyes to kind of say there are so many good people in this world. So now where when I do speak out a lot about these things, is for me to try and help other people like I was helped because I know how much of an impact it can have on your life. Yeah, just uh, on that, I just, I'm kind of blown away listening to you there, Mark. But I think, you know, on behalf of, of everyone ahead in the game, I just want to thank you for everything you've just kind of gone through there because a lot of what we talk about, you know, is the importance of being able to speak out about your problems, being able to reach out to friends and, and even, you know, being able to or being your friends being able to listen or being there for you and, and a lot yeah. of the times right you don't you don't think you think you're gonna you're bored and if you reach out to someone you're gonna put your yeah. burden on someone else and i've listened to a couple of other interviews for you so how, how important kind of was it that I, I i know i listened to an interview just before we came on where wayne hartswell invited you in not long after you had had your your heart surgery how important was something like that there? Was that was that a feeling of, all right, I belong? Because obviously you're coming out of this world where, as you say, every 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 day for, for what, 10 years has been all football for you. Yeah. And, and to have that removed, now somebody's kind of offering that olive branch to bring you back in, maybe not in a full-time capacity, but bringing you in just to, to stay involved. How important was that for you to have that, that kind of support network? That honestly... That's what has kind of kept me on the straight and narrow, if, if I'm going to be totally honest. That's what's kept me in routine to the only routine I've ever known through my whole life, which is crazy to say. But, like, to be able to still go in each day and still be part of the lads, like, to still go in and still have the banter around to kind of keep your spirits up. But then also to know that I had the support and I actually felt like I was safe going in because I knew everybody had me, me best kind of held that interest. So, like, Wayne Hatswell would sit and talk with me about loads of different things away from football, ask me how I'm getting on. Like, the new manager who's just come in now, like, Michael Flynn was amazing with me to let me come in and travel to every away game and to go to every game to keep me in the loop of everything because, like I said, it was it was something that football was a massive part of my life, so I was never going to get rid of it. And then the new manager who's just come in has been amazing with me as well, um, James Robry. He's somebody who sees what I can kind of bring as in on a personal level to people and be there for help. And like I said, just having these people around me is, is is something where, like you say, you want to give everything back to them. And it was a massive turning point to kind of keep me in a structure and a routine because, like I said, I ended up going into depression after I retired because I lost all routine. I thought, well, I don't have to get out of bed. Why do I want to get out of bed? I was struggling physically with the open heart surgery because you have to get out and walk every day and I just couldn't be bothered to and I had to take a I had to take counseling sessions for them to tell me Mark you've got health anxiety and you've got PTSD from 
the the surgery, which, like I said, it was all new to me. I never knew anything about it. But then when I explained all my symptoms, they said, Mark, they're depressed. And I, and to me, you think depressing is you feel sad. But at the same time, I didn't feel sad. I just felt as though I'm not, I can't be bothered. Again. Like you just couldn't be bothered with anything. I just didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to do anything. And that, that that's what kind of was an eye opener to me to say depression is more than just say, feel sad. Okay, crack a smile. There's more to it where you have these down days and you have days where you're thinking to yourself, do you know what? this isn't for me and then one day turns into two days turns into a week where you're just sitting around in bed and it's 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 it is something where you have to go through a battle with yourself and it's more about just accepting all these symptoms and accepting everything to kind of say yeah do you know what I don't feel great and I don't feel quite well enough and do you know what today I, I was always someone who was hard on myself and to not be so hard on myself I struggled with because when you're in the profession that you are you, you want the best for yourself so I would go into training some days, but I wouldn't actually train or do any fitness stuff. And I'd be really annoyed with myself to say, I've gone all this way and I've not trained. Whereas sometimes I had to strip her all back where the counsellor would say to me, but Mark, be proud that you actually went into training today that you got out of bed. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't train. And then when I once I got the chance to strip her all back and kind of see for myself that it's the little things that, it's the little things that kind of steadily build you back to yourself. It's not about, taking the big leap to go okay I haven't been to the gym in four days right I'm gonna go out and do a marathon it's about okay I'll go out and do a five minute walk and then that five minute walk I turn it to 10 minutes and then when I started to kind of show that kind of appreciation to the small things then bigger things start to get easier and that's how I like slowly and steadily built myself back and like I said now till this day I still have days where I look at where I do I wouldn't say struggle massively but I still have days where I'll say to know what I'm not feeling too good today and I'll have like the little kind of yeah like today isn't a day for me but you know what I know for the fact that I'm, well do you know what at least I'm out of bed today and if I don't do much in training well at least I made it into the training ground so then when you when I do appreciate it, I don't be hard on myself anymore and don't get me wrong I still sometimes need that bit of a kick up the backside to say right come on you need to do this today which I think everybody needs but then also I I, I, I have the friends now where I'm not afraid to open up and say do you know what, I'm struggling today and do you know what, I feel a bit iffy today where people are there to just say, okay, come sit around in my house with me. So at least I know if I have company there, the anxiety level's going to drop because what kind of I struggled with was being by myself because I felt as though with being away from home and yeah, everybody's a phone call away, but when you're by yourself, you're left to your own devices and you think a million and one things go through your head and sometimes you're better off sitting in those thoughts to then let them go away to realise, you know what, they do come and go. It's not like the end of the world. And I just think that's why I say in the weirdest, strangest way possible, I'm glad I went through it to understand it a hell of a lot more that when I do, or if I do try and speak to someone, I know I'm talking out of experience to say, I know what, it, like, I know what help can do. And I know what talking out can do as difficult as it can be, but it only takes that one person to listen or it only takes that one person for you to affect to know that it could be a snowball effect where that person can go and help somebody. And like you say, somebody who's afraid to talk out could listen to me speak and go, well, do you know what? That has helped me today. And no one needs to know that it's, that it's helped me. But like I said, I've, I've had messages through social media to say certain things that I've spoken about um, has helped people. And like I said, if, if, if I can be that next person to be a success story for someone who could go through things, then, so be it that could be my next purpose and that's what gives me the excitement and it gives me that next kind of fire in the stomach to kind of like pursue these things and as I said like there's loads of people like I mentioned like I'm in a group chat with um, lads back in Ireland and Jeff Hendrick and like I said I know I've dropped his name in a couple of times but he's somebody who I've known since I'm eight nine years old that he's like another brother to me and I don't get to see him as often in football, but he makes sure to stay in touch and he phones me all the, like we text all the time. And there's, there's lads in that group chat that I would write into the group chat where nine times out of 10, you wouldn't say it to, to your mates. But I wrote in and said, lads, I'm really struggling. And they were more than happy to write me messages and make sure I was okay and phone me and to make sure everything was all right. And like I said, them and themselves are amazing people where you don't think you're going to have that support where you think, oh, the lads are going to say he's been a bit soft. Like, I think it's the whole stigma around it is 
if you if you speak out about it like that, you have like to be vulnerable in front of people is the most difficult thing ever. And I struggled with being vulnerable because I was always the one to lift people's spirits and be the jokey, happy one. And the, the times where I actually thought, you know what, no, I'm going to be open and honest is the time I opened my eyes to say, you know what, there actually are everybody's out there willing to help you. You just have to ask for that help. And people are more than happy to do that for you. And I think once I hit that realisation, I think it's it's opened my eyes to a whole different kind of world and and it's opened my eyes to a bit more kind of empathy towards people to where a lot more people open up to me now because they know I'm going to be open and honest. And if they know that you are struggling, then they're more than happy to speak about their struggles because they think, well, I don't feel strange telling you because you went through it, you will understand. And that's something where the only way to know that or you understand is because you need to open up, like people do need to open up and talk as strange or as, as minor as it is, or as big as it is, a small thing such as that can manifest and turn out to be an, a massive thing. And like I said, I had to go through it all and learn that for myself. But once I have, it's it's something that is, it's, it's worth its weight in gold to me, where I feel as though I have such more of an understanding of myself and so many more problems that people come across. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's incredible just um, listening to you and, how open and honest you've been. So thanks very much for that. It's been it's been incredible. It's just, I suppose, your positive outlook and everything is infectious. Even just listening, I don't know about Dean, but just listening to you is sort of inspiring for me, myself. Like even when you're talking about the struggles you've sort of been with, the doubt you've had in your head, even the anxiety of you being at home alone and 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 having the panic attacks and like you said, as soon as you started reaching out to people and talking about it, that was sort of a turning point for you. Which yeah. is sort of the whole point that we're trying to get at is to try and take away the stigma that, you know, inst instead of putting it as a negative and, oh, I better not talk about this and it, it's snowballing out of control, that if you talk to somebody, it, it just lifts the weight off your shoulders immediately. And even though, you, you, like you said, you have your little struggles where... Some days you might want to do something, but in the back of your head, you're probably thinking, you know what, if I send a message into this group or if I reach out yeah. to a certain person, they'll be, they'll be straight back to me. And you've sort of built up that that network. And because you're so open with people, then people are coming to you as, you know, as, as the guide of, of what to do in that sort of situation. It's, it's, it's really inspiring, Mark, to be honest with you. Like, like I said, there's, there's, there's loads of people and, like, there's two other fellas that I forgot to mention. Um, Like, these two lads, I think, out of all the counselling sessions that I've had, are two of the main people that I think gave me that light at the end of the tunnel moment every time I spoke to them. So, like, I'd done counselling, which kind of made me accept to speak about things and to be a bit more open and to reflect on a lot. But I think these two lads, Dean Hammond and uh, Lewis Harrington, they, um, I'd done a podcast with them and we spoke... And they reached out to me after it and said, Mark, like, we can see that you're struggling. Like, do you want to do a Zoom call once a week and let us just sit and chat to each other and sit and talk? And, and we'll just, like, we'll, we'll speak about experiences and we'll help you along the way. And I was like, do you know what? Like I said, I'm trying everything else to feel good. I'm going to see what this is like. And every single time, like, the, the way, like, the one thing that I kind of noticed for myself is the, the more people that can relate to you, you feel easier to open up and talk to. Like, so I wouldn't have to openly say, all right, I'm depressed or I'm this or I'm that. But they would understand that that's how I was feeling because one of them in, well, they both went through retirement in their, in their own sport. They both went through retirement. One of them went through retirement in football and he understood me straight away to how I was feeling towards saying, I think I feel as though I've lost myself. He had the exact same feeling and knew exactly how I felt. So he knew how to speak to me on that aspect. And then, you, and then Lewis Harrington was able to speak to me on, on depression side of things and to know what I can do mentally to affect you. And like I said, them two lads to sit and take the time out where I never knew them before the podcast, never knew anything about them, to then reach out as out of their, out the kindness out of their own hearts to reach out to me and try and help me because they could see I was struggling was, was something that even opened my eyes to say, Do you know what, if it wasn't for them two as, as well as everybody else, like them two was, are two people that, like I said, I'd still open up and write messages to them now to make sure, and they still text me to make sure I'm doing okay and to meet up now COVID and stuff like that and restrictions have lifted. 
and that two friends for life that I see now that 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 like it's something where a bad situation of what I had to go through has created a, a better like I've I've surrounded myself with people that I know are going to be there for me for life and to have that kind of feeling to know you've got people for life and they can they're going to be there for you through your good times which they want to see you successful but they're going to be there for you when you are struggling to your really lowest and that's when they and that's when for me I was like you know what these people are friends for life because if someone can stick stick by you and help you through stuff like that then you know what like they're, they're genuine people in my eyes yeah they're in, they're in it for the right reasons for for your benefit and even when you flip it over that you were able to help them as well I, I'm sure they appreciate that so much and like even to take your own time to use your experience to help people um, is incredible. And um, is that like, obviously now that you're, you're saying you'll go back to the training ground and you do a little bit there, is there any plans for further down the line or are you just taking it as it comes at the minute? I think all last year was more just taking it as it comes um, because I was still kind of in the realm of still dealing with the, retirement and stuff and getting used to watching football instead of playing it and being still in the environment which I did struggle with but I think now I can kind of see that light where I'm starting a course hopefully with Paul McVeigh um, on to learn about keynote speaking um, which is something where I, I, I got in touch with Paul and, and he thinks exactly the same where he, he feels as though me speaking out and my story can help a lot of people and, and could and could be good for me. Um, staying involved with Newport is something where because it's a club that's really close to me and they help me through a lot. Um, I'm more than happy to want to be successful with Newport um, and, and be that kind of uh, in and around the change room to, to speak with the lads and share my experiences with them. And then also on the flip side of that is is I, I've done a bit of like commentary stuff with BBC along the way and I've I've kind of branched out into that kind of media side of stuff where I actually am really enjoying it and they're all stuff that I've just said yes to everything now because everything's new to me so if I'm start throwing things down without realising if I like it or not then I'll never know what to do so I've said yes to a lot of things but I think speaking out is the next venture for me to kind of be able to talk out a lot more and get my story a lot more out there for myself and obviously, as I said, on a personal level, it helps me to know I'm helping other people because then when you connect with people, it just it broadens your mind and, and, and it makes you think a lot more into things. And as I said, um, that is probably like the next thing for me as well as staying in and around football because I don't think I'll ever come away from it because, as you say, once it's your life, it's a difficult thing to come away from. Yeah, I think, Mark, uh, it's, it's honestly, I've sat for the last almost an hour now and just listen to you and I think it's a really good story that you have to tell you know so um, I think the more people the more ears you can get to listen especially in the younger generation that you know they're, they're going through different hardships that maybe maybe people in, in our area didn't go through you know so being able to help them uh, is something that I think is going to be very important moving forward but look as I say you're talking to us almost an hour and I, I'm, I, I, we appreciate your, your generosity with your time um, as we wind down now, I suppose one one kind of final question would be, and I think I think I know what the answer is going to be, but one one message you would have to people that's listening to this podcast that maybe you know are are going through struggles. Um, what would you what would your one message be maybe to those people? I'd say probably one message is that no matter how bad the struggles are, or no matter how down you might feel, there's always going to be a time where it will turn around where you have to surround yourself with the right people speak out a lot more or even speak to someone that you might trust or even speak to it like I always say sometimes speak to not I wouldn't say a random person but I'd say speak to somebody who is um, not as closely connected to you because you could be open and honest with that person but I think once you just open up to be open and honest and release that stress off your shoulders I think you, you, you see you see a day is torn and then I just feel as though I think if you surround yourself with the right people and I think you, I think for anybody you know who the right people are in your life that you can really like kind of be there for and I think if you open yourself up to that, that I think downtime never last and I think if you kind of persevere through them and push yourself through them 
and I was someone who thought like and I've had I've had moments and I'm not gonna lie I've had moments where I've broke out into tears thinking is this me for the rest of my life and to see where I am now I'm like two different people and I noticed that in myself but I think to be self-aware to know that things aren't right and to speak out about it is something that is very very vital to all of this and I think if you if you're able to do that even on a, on a small st- on a small scale, it's going to like make a massive difference in your life. And to realize that sometimes things could always be worse. And if you're still in the mode where you can speak to somebody, I think that's that's the only thing I can ever say is is talking. And I was never one for talking because the one thing I thought I'd always be is a board. And the one thing I realized, you're, like, you're the forwardest thing from a board. And if somebody is genuinely care for you, then they will do above and beyond for you. Yeah, yeah. Mark, this has been phenomenal. I'm going to give Steph the final word now in a second, but I just really appreciate your time. Um, no, being, able no to, being able to hear your story. And I want, want to just apologize that you're stuck in a hospital and you get a FaceTime from Wayne Hartswell. I just want to apologize <laughs> for that one. Um, Do you know what? He actually made me smile and in all fairness. He made he, me laugh, so he was good. Uh, it was needed no, thanks a million Mark yeah no just taking on from Dean there just uh, it's been so worthwhile getting you in just hearing your story it's just been incredible and for you to be so open and honest with us I've no doubt that there's going to be people listening to this that will take a lot from it they'll be inspired by it and um, yeah it's just another thank you and I suppose I was just going to ask you one more question before because we usually like to ask somebody that's been on what the what their career sort of highlights been and what 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 you, what you thought your best moment was in football, I suppose. Do you know what? In all fairness, I feel as though I've got a couple of them where making me debut at sixteen was was one that was amazing. I think um, scoring scoring my first professional goal was turned out to be a historic goal for Newport was was another amazing achievement. To get the captain Newport to Wembley was another one to be a captain at Wembley was was amazing achievement. And then I, I, I just feel as though to to just to to be part of a team where you see it year in, year in, year out, to be part of a giant killing team in in um in football in the FA Cup was an amazing feeling. Like the torn out of fans, we got the atmosphere around the place to play against Manchester City and to stand on the field with some players that like you say, the whole squad, I think that day was worth 600 million. And you're sitting, you're standing there thinking, we have to play against this. But that in itself is a memory that, that will live with me forever. And like I said, just the people I've come across in, in, in football, like football in, in itself for a career has been one big memory. And it's something that the one thing I do say to all the younger lads is, is that like the money, the cars, the fame, everything comes and goes. But if you are somebody who've created so many memories in football, they will last with you forever. And that's something that I think people underestimate that. I've I've said it, I've said it before, where I'm glad I made the memories that I have because I feel as though if I never had them memories, then I look back at football and go, maybe I didn't achieve enough or yeah, people might have made money. But I know that I've got moments now where I can call up certain Ex teammates are certain lads now to this day and say, oh, I remember when we played in that great escape, or do you remember that time at Wembley, and do you remember when we went and done this? That's something that's going to live with you forever. And I think no matter where I go in the world and no matter what I do, to have them memories is, is something that's priceless. And like I said, football is something that I, I appreciate that to an extent, football saved me life, and I always will be lucky for that. But to be able to turn around and say that I made a career for myself, regardless of the of the the troubles with the health along the way is something that I'm proud of doing. And like I said, um, I think just the, the career in itself is one massive highlight. And then obviously working with Wayne Haswell. <laughs> He'll enjoy that one, all right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's incredible. Thanks very much for taking the time out and speaking with us. And no I've no doubt just... just- yeah, just listening to you has inspired me um, and I'm sure it'll inspire a lot of more people along the way. So thanks very much from all of us in heading the game. No, no problem at all. I absolutely love it. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark.